Wedding Morn by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org. The morning breaks like a pomegranate in a shining crack of red. Ah, when tomorrow the dawn comes late, whitening across the bed, it will find me watching at the marriage gate and waiting while light is shed on him who is sleeping satiate with a sunk abandoned head and when the dawn comes creeping in cautiously i shall raise myself to watch the morning win my first of days as it shows him sleeping a sleep he got of me as under my gaze he grows distinct and i see his hot face freed of the wavering blaze then i shall know which image of god my man is made toward and i shall know my bitter rod or my rich reward and i shall know the stamp and worth of the coin i've accepted as mine shall see an image of heaven or of earth on his minted metal shine yea and i long to see him sleep in my power utterly i long to know what i have to keep i long to see my love that spinning coin laid still and plain at the side of me for me to count for i know he will greatly enrich in me and then he will be mine he will lie in my power utterly opening his value plain to my eye he will sleep of me he will lie negligent resign his all to me and i shall watch the dawn light up for me the sleeping wealth of mine and i shall watch the wane light shine on his sleep that is filled of me on his brow where the wisps of fond hair twine so truthfully on his lips where the light breaths come and go naive and winsomely on his limbs that i shall weep to know lie under my mastery end of poem this recording is in the public domain Kisses in the Train by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Yearsley. I saw the Midlands revolve through her hair, the fields of autumn stretching bare, and sheep on the pasture tossed back in a scare. And still, as ever, the world went round. My mouth on her pulsing neck was found, and my breast to her beating breast was bound. But my heart at the centre of all in a swound was still as a pivot as all the ground on its prowling orbit shifted round and still in my nostrils the scent of her flesh and still my wet mouth sought her afresh and still one pulse through the world did thresh and the world all whirling around in joy like the dance of a dervish did destroy my sense and my reason spun like a toy but firm at the centre my heart was found her own to my perfect heartbeat bound like a magnet's keeper closing the round end of poem this recording is in the public domain Cruelty in Love by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. What large dark hands are those at the window, lifted, grasping the golden light which weaves its way through the creeper leaves to my heart's delight? Ah, only the leaves. But in the west, in the west, I see a redness come over the evening's burning breast. Tis the wound of love goes home. The woodbine creeps abroad, calling low to her lover. The sunlit flirt who all the day has poised above her lips in play, and stolen kisses shallow and gay of pollen now has gone away. She woos the moth with her sweet low word, and when above her his broad wings hover, then her bright breasts she will uncover and yield her honey-drop to her lover. 
into the yellow evening glow saunters a man from the farm below leans and looks in at the low-built shed where hangs the swallow's marriage bed the bird lies warm against the wall she glances quick her startled eyes towards him then she turns away her small head making warm display of red upon the throat his tears sway her out of the nest warm busy ball whose plaintive cries heard as she flies in one blue stoop from out the sties into the evening's empty hall o oh, water hen beside the rushes hide your quaint unfading blushes still your quick tail and lie as dead till the distance folds over his ominous tread the rabbit presses back her ears turns back her liquid anguished eyes and crouches low then with wild spring spurts from the tear of his oncoming to be choked back the wire ring her frantic effort throttling piteous brown ball of quivering fears ah soon in his large hard hand she dies and swings all loose to the swing of his walk yet calm and kindly are his eyes and ready to open in brown surprise should i not answer to his talk or should he my tears surmise i hear his hand on the latch and rise from my chair watching the door open he flashes bare his strong teeth in a smile and flashes his eyes in a smile like triumph upon me then careless wise he flings the rabbit soft on the table board and comes toward me ah the uplifted sword of his hand against my bosom and oh the broad blade of his hand that raised my face to applaud his coming he raises up my face to him and caresses my mouth with his fingers which still smell grim of the rabbit's fur god i am caught in a snare i know not what fine wires round my throat i only know i let him finger there my pulse of life letting him nose like a stoat who sniffs with joy before he drinks the blood and down his mouth comes to my mouth and down his dark bright eyes descend like a fiery hood upon my mind his mouth meets mine and a flood of sweet fire sweeps across me so i drown within him die and find death good end of poem this recording is in the public domain cherry robbers by d h lawrence read for librivox dot org by thomas peter under the long dark boughs like jewels red in the hair of an eastern girl shine strings of crimson cherries as if had bled blood drops beneath each curl under the glistening cherries with folded wings three dead birds lie pale-breasted throstles and a blackbird robberlings stained with red dye under the haystack a girl stands laughing at me with cherries hung round her ears offering me her scarlet fruit I will see if she has any tears. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lilies in the Fire by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. One. Ah, you stack of white lilies, all white and gold i am adrift as a sunbeam and without form or having save i light on you to warm your pallor into radiance flush your cold white beauty into incandescence you are not a stack of white lilies to-night but a white and clustered star transfigured by me to-night and lighting those ruddy leaves like a star dropped through the slender bare arms of the branches your tire maidens who lift swart arms to fend me off but i come like a wind of fire upon you like to some stray white beam 
who on you his fire unladens and you are a glistening toadstool shining here among the crumpled beech leaves phosphorescent my stack of white lilies burning incandescent of me a soft white star among the leaves my dear two is it with pain my dear that you shudder so is it because i have hurt you with pain my dear did i shiver nay truly i did not know a dewdrop may be splashed on my face down here why even now you speak through closed shut teeth i have been too much for you ah i remember the ground is a little chilly underneath the leaves and dear you consume me all to an ember you hold yourself all hard as if my kisses hurt as i gave them you put me away ah never i put you away yet each kiss hisses hot as a drop of fire wastes me away three i am ashamed you wanted me not to-night nay it is always so you sigh with me your radiance dims when i draw too near and my free fire enters your petals like death you wilt dead white ah i do know and i am deep ashamed you love me while i hover tenderly like clinging sunbeams kissing you but see when i close in fire upon you and you are flamed with the swiftest fire of my love you are destroyed tis a degradation deep to me that my best soul's whitest lightning which should bright attest god stepping down to earth in one white stride means only to you a clogged numb burden of flesh heavy to bear even heavy to uprear again from earth like lilies wilted and sere flagged on the floor that before stood up so fresh End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Coldness in Love by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. And you remember, in the afternoon, the sea and the sky went gray, as if there had sunk a flocculent dust on the floor of the world the festoon of the sky sagged dusty as spider cloth and coldness clogged the sea till it ceased to croon a dank sickening scent came up from the grime of weed that blackened the shore so that i recoiled feeling the raw cold done me and all the time you leapt about on the slippery rocks and threw the words that rang with a brassy shallow chime and all day long that raw and ancient cold deadened me through till the gray downs darkened to sleep then i longed for you with your mantle of love to fold me over and drive from out of my body the deep cold that had sunk to my soul and there kept hold but still to me all evening long you were cold and i was numb with a bitter deathly ache till old days drew me back into their fold and dim sheep crowded me warm with companionship and old ghosts clustered me close and sleep was cajoled i slept till dawn at the window blew in like dust like the linty raw cold dust disturbed from the floor of a disused room a gray pale light like must that settled upon my face and hands till it seemed to flourish there as pale mold blooms on a crust then i rose in fear needing you fearfully 
for i thought you were warm as a sudden jet of blood i thought i could plunge in your spurting hotness and be clean of the cold and the must with my hand on the latch i heard you in your sleep speak strangely to me and i dared not enter feeling suddenly dismayed so i went and washed my deadened flesh in the sea and came back tingling clean but worn and frayed with cold like the shell of the moon and strange it seems that my love has dawned in rose again like the love of a maid end of poem this recording is in the public domain End of Another Home Holiday by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org. 1. When shall I see the half moon sink again behind the black sycamore at the end of the garden? When will the scent of the dim white flux creep up the wall to me and in at my open window? Why is it the long, slow stroke of the midnight bell? Will it never finish the twelve? Falls again and again on my heart with a heavy reproach. The moon mist is over the village. Out of the mist speaks the bell. And all the little roofs of the village bow low, pitiful, beseeching, resigned. Oh, little home, what is it I have not done well? Ah, home, suddenly I love you as I hear the sharp, clean trot of a pony down the road, succeeding sharp little sounds dropping into the silence, clear upon the long-drawn hoarseness of a train across the valley. The light has gone out from under my mother's door, that she should love me so, she so lonely, graying now, and I, leaving her, bent on my pursuits love is the great asker the sun and the rain do not ask the secret of the time when the grain struggles down in the dark the moon walks her lonely way without anguish because no loved one grieves over her departure two for ever ever by my shoulder pitiful love will linger crouching as little houses crouch under the mist when i turn Forever, out of the mist, the church lifts up her reproachful finger, pointing my eyes in wretched defiance where love hides her face to mourn. Oh, but the rain creeps down to wet the grain that struggles alone in the dark, and asking nothing, cheerfully steals back again. The moon sets forth o' nights to walk the lonely, dusky heights serenely, with steps unswerving, pursued by no sigh of bereavement, no tears of love unnerving her constant tread, while ever at my side, frail and sad, with grey bowed head, the beggar woman, the yearning eyed, inexorable love goes lagging. The wild young heifer, glancing distraught, with a strange new knocking of life at her side, runs seeking a loneliness the little grain draws down the earth to hide nay even the slumberous egg as it labours under the shell patiently to divide and self-divide asks to be hidden and wishes nothing to tell but when i draw the scanty cloak of silence over my eyes piteous love comes peering under the hood touches the clasp with trembling fingers and tries to put her ear to the painful sob of my blood while her tears soak through to my breast where they burn and cauterize three the moon lies back and reddens in the valley a corncrank calls monotonously with the piteous unalterable plaint that deadens my confident activity with a hoarse, insistent request that falls unweariedly, unweariedly, asking something more of me, yet more of me. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Reminder by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Do you remember how night after night swept level and low overhead at home, and had not one star, nor one narrow gate for the moon to go forth to her field of November? And you remember how towards the north a red blot on the sky burns like a blotch of anxiety over the forges, and small flames ply like ghosts the shadow of the ember. Those were the days when it was awful autumn to me when only there glowed on the dark of the sky the red reflection of her agony my beloved smelting down in the blaze of death my dearest love who had borne and was now leaving me and i at the foot of her cross did suffer my own gethsemane so i came to you and twice after great kisses i saw the rim of the moon divinely rise and strive to detach herself from the raw blackened edge of the sky strive to escape with her whiteness revealing my sunken world tall and loftily shadowed but the moon never magnolia like unfurled her white her lamp-like shape for you told me no and bade me not to ask for the dour communion offering a better thing so i lay on your breast for an obscure hour feeling your fingers go like a rhythmic breeze over my hair and tracing my brows till i knew you not from a little wind i wonder now if god allows us only one moment his keys if only then you could have unlocked the moon on the night and i baptized myself in the light of your love we both have entered then the white pure passion and never again i wonder if only you had taken me then how different life would have been should i have spent myself in waste and you have bent your pride through being lonely. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. By Hennef, by D. H. Lawrence, read for LibriVox.org, by Eva Davis. The little river twittering in the twilight, the wan, wondering look of the pale sky. This is almost bliss. And everything shut up and gone to sleep. All the troubles and anxieties and pain gone under the twilight. Only the twilight now and the soft shh of the river that will last forever. And at last, I know my love for you is here. I can see it all. It is whole like the twilight. It is large, so large I could not see it before, because of the little lights and flickers and interruptions, troubles, anxieties, and pains. You are the call, and I am the answer. You are the wish, and I the fulfillment. You are the night, and I the day. What else? It is perfect enough. It is perfectly complete. You and I. What more? Strange how we suffer in spite of this. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lightning by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Yearsley. I felt the lurch and halt of her heart next to my breast, where my own heart was beating, and I laughed to feel it plunge and bound, and strange in my blood-swept ears was the sound of the words i kept repeating repeating with tightened arms and the hot blood's blindfold art her breath flew warm against my neck warm as a flame in the close night air 
and the sense of her clinging flesh was sweet where her arms and my neck's blood surge could meet holding her thus did i care that the black night hid her from me blotted out every speck i leaned me forward to find her lips and claim her utterly in a kiss when the lightning flew across her face and i saw her for the flaring space of a second afraid of the clips of my arms inert with dread wilted in fear of my kiss a moment like a wavering spark her face lay there before my breast pale love lost in a snow of fear and guarded by a glittering tear and lips apart with dumb cries a moment and she was taken again in the merciful dark i heard the thunder and felt the rain and my arms fell loose and i was dumb almost i hated her she was so good hated myself and the place and my blood which burned with rage as i bade her come home away home ere the lightning floated forth again end of poem this recording is in the public domain Song Day in Autumn by D. H. Lawrence Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Yearsley When the autumn roses are heavy with dew, Before the mist discloses the leaf's brown hue, You would, among the laughing hills of yesterday, Walk innocent in the daffodils, Coiffing up your auburn hair in a Puritan fillet, A chaste white snare to catch and keep me with you there so far away when from the autumn roses trickles the dew when the blue mist uncloses and the sun looks through you from those startled hills come away out of the withering daffodils thoughtful and half afraid plaiting a heavy auburn braid and coiling it round the wise brows of a maid who was scared in her play when in the autumn roses creeps a bee and a trembling flower encloses his ecstasy you from your lonely walk turn away and leaning to me like a flower on its stalk wait among the beeches for your late bee who beseeches to creep through your loosened hair till he reaches your heart of dismay end of poem this recording is in the public domain aware by d h lawrence read for LibriVox.org by eva davis slowly the moon is rising out of the ruddy haze divesting herself of her golden shift and so emerging white and exquisite and i in a maze see in the sky before me a woman i did not know i loved but there she goes and her beauty hurts my heart i follow her down the night begging her not to depart end of poem this recording is in the public domain. A Pang of Reminiscence by D. H. Lawrence, read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. High and smaller goes the moon. She is small and very far from me, wistful and candid, watching me wistfully and i see trembling blue in her pallor a tear that surely i have seen before a tear which i had hoped that even hell held not again in store end of poem this recording is in the public domain a white blossom by D. H. Lawrence, read for LibriVox.org, by Eva Davis. 
a tiny moon as white and small as a single jasmine flower leans all alone above my window on night's wintry bower liquid as lime tree blossom soft as brilliant water or rain she shines the one white love of my youth which all sin cannot stain end of poem this recording is in the public domain Red Moonrise by D. H. Lawrence, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The train in running across the wheeled has fallen into a steadier stroke, so even it beats like silence, and sky and earth in one unbroke embrace of darkness lie around, and crushed between them all the loose and littered lettering of leaves and hills and houses closed and we can use the open book of landscape no more for the covers of darkness have shut upon its written pages and sky and earth and all between are closed in one and we are smothered between the darkness we close our eyes and say hush we try to escape in sleep the terror of this immense deep darkness and we lie wrapped up for sleep and then dear god from out of the twofold darkness red as if from the womb the moon arises as if the twin-walled darkness had bled in one great spasm of birth and given us this new red moonrise which lies on the knees of the darkness bloody and makes us hide our eyes the train beats frantic in haste and struggles away from this ruddy terror of birth that has slid down from out of the loins of night to flame our way with fear but god i am glad so glad that i drown my terror with joy of confirmation for now lies god all red before me and i am glad as the magi were when they saw the rosy brow of the infant bless their constant folly which had brought them thither to god for now i know that the womb is a great red passion whence rises all the shapeliness that decks us here below yea like the fire that boils within this ball of earth and quickens all herself with flowers god burns within the stiffened clay of us and every flash of thought that we and ours send up to heaven and every movement does fly like a spark from this godfire of passion and pain of birth and joy of the begetting and sweat of labour and the meanest fashion of fretting or of gladness but the jetting of a trail of the great fire against the sky where we can see it a jet from the innermost fire and even in the watery shells that lie alive within the cosy undermire a grain of this same fire i can descry and then within the screaming birds that fly across the lightning when the storm leaps higher and then the swirling flaming folk that try to come like fire flames at their fierce desire they are as earth's dread spurting flames that ply a while and gush forth death and then expire and though it be love's wet blue eyes that cry to hot love to relinquish its desire still in their depths i see the same red spark as rose to-night upon us from the dark end of poem this recording is in the public domain Return by D. H. Lawrence, read for LibriVox.org. Now I come again. You who have so desired my coming, why do you look away from me? Why does your cheek burn against me? Have I inspired such anger as sets your mouth unwontedly? Ah, here I sit while you break the music beneath your bow, for broken it is and hurting to hear cease then from music does anguish of absence bequeath me only aloofness when i would draw near end of poem this recording is in the public domain the appeal by d h lawrence read for librivox dot org by jack allen on april second twenty seventeen you, Helen, who see the stars as mistletoe berries burning in a black tree, 
You surely, seeing I am a bowl of kisses, should put your mouth to mine and drink of me. Helen, you let my kisses steam, wasteful into the night's black nostrils. Drink me up, I pray, O oh, you who are night's bacante. How can you from my bowl of kisses shrink? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Repulsed by D. H. Lawrence, read for LibriVox.org, by Eva Davis. The last silk-floating thought has gone from the dandelion stem, and the flesh of the stalk holds up for nothing a blank diadem. The night's flood winds have lifted my last desire from me, and my hollow flesh stands up in the night abandonedly. Overhead, the nightly heavens, like an open, immense eye, like a cat's distended pupil, sparkles with sudden stars, as with thoughts that flash and crackle in uncouth malignancy, they glitter at me, and I fear the fierce snapping of night's thought stars. Beyond me, up in the darkness, goes the gush of the lights of two towns, as the breath which rushes upwards from the nostrils of an immense life crouched across the globe, ready, if need be, to pounce across the space upon heaven's high hostile eminence. All round me, but far away, the night's twin consciousness roars, with sounds that endlessly swell and sink like the storm of thought in the brain lifting and falling like slow breaths taken pulsing like oars immense that beat the blood of the night down its vein the night is immense and awful helen and i am insect small in the fur of this hill clung on to the fur of shaggy black heather a palpitant speck in the fur of the night and afraid of all, seeing the world and the sky like creatures hostile together. And I in the fur of the world, and you a pale fleck from the sky, how we hate each other tonight, hate you and I. As the world of activity hates the dream that goes on on high, as a man hates the dreaming woman he loves, but who will not reply? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dream Confused by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. Is that the moon at the window so big and red? No one in the room, no one near the bed. Listen, her shoon palpitating down the stair, or beat of wings at the window there. A moment ago she kissed me, warm on the mouth, the very moon in the south is warm with a bloody glow, the moon from far abysses signaling those two kisses. And now the moon goes slowly out of the west, and slowly back in my breast my kisses are sinking soon to leave me at rest and a poem this recording is in the public domain Crow by d h lawrence read for librivox dot org the trees rise tall and taller lifted on a subtle rush of cool gray flame that issuing out of the dawn has sifted the spirit from each leaf's frame for the trailing leisurely rapture of life drifts dimly forward easily hidden by bright leaves uttered aloud and strife of shapes in the gray mist chidden the gray phosphorescent pellucid advance of the luminous purpose of god shines out where the lofty trees athwart stream chance to shake flakes of its shadow about 
the subtle steady rush of the whole gray foam mist of advancing god as he silently sweeps to his somewhere his goal is heard in the grass of the sod is heard in the windless whisper of leaves in the silent labors of men in the fields in the downward dropping of flimsy sheaves of cloud the rain skies yield in the tapping haste of a fallen leaf in the flapping of red roof smoke and the small foot-stepping tap of men beneath these trees so huge and tall for what can all sharp-rimmed substance but catch in a backward ripple god's purpose reveal for a moment his mighty direction snatch a spark beneath his wheel since god sweeps onward dim and vast creating the channeled vein of man and leaf for his passage his shadow is cast on all for us to scan ah listen for silence is not lonely imitate the magnificent trees that speak no word of their rapture but only breathe largely the luminous breeze end of poem this recording is in the public domain morning work by d h lawrence read for librivox dot org by thomas peter a gang of laborers on the piled wet timber that shines blood red beside the railway siding seem to be making out of the blue of the morning something fairy and fine the shuttles sliding the red gold spools of their hands and faces shuttling hither and thither across the morn's crystalline frame of blue trolls at the cave of ringing cerulean mining and laughing with work living their work like a game end of poem this recording is in the public domain transformations by d h lawrence read for librivox dot org one the town o oh, you stiff shapes swift transformation seethes about you only last night you were a sodom smouldering in the dense soiled air to-day a thicket of sunshine with blue smoke wreaths to-morrow swimming in evening's vague dim vapour like a weeded city in shadow under the sea beneath an ocean of shimmering light you will be then a group of toadstools waiting the moon's white taper and when i awake in the morning after rain to find the new houses a cluster of lilies glittering in scarlet alive with the birds bright twittering i'll say your bond of ugliness is vain two the earth o oh, earth you spinning clod of earth and then you lamp you lemon-coloured beauty o oh, earth you rotten apple rolling downward then brilliant earth from the burr of night in beauty as a jewel-brown horse chestnut newly issued you are all these and strange it is my duty to take you all sordid or radiant tissued three men o oh, laborers o oh, shuttles across the blue frame of morning you feet of the rainbow balancing the sky o oh, you who flash your arms like rockets to heaven who in lassitude lean as yachts on the sea-wind lie you who in crowds are rhododendrons in blossom who stand alone in pride like lighted lamps who grappling down with work or hate or passion take strange lithe form of a beast that sweats and ramps you who are twisted in grief like crumpled beech leaves who curl in sleep like kittens, who kiss as a swarm of clustered, vibrating bees, who fall to earth at last like a bean-pod. What are you, O oh multiform? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Renaissance by D. H. Lawrence Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter 
we have bit no forbidden apple eve and i yet the splashes of day and night falling round us no longer dapple the same eden with purple and white this is our own still valley our eden our home but day shows it vivid with feeling and the pallor of night does not tally with dark sleep that once covered its ceiling my little red heifer to-night i looked in her eyes she will calve to-morrow last night when i went with the lantern the sow was grabbing her litter with red snarling jaws and i heard the cries of the newborn and after that the old owl then the bats that flitter and i woke to the sound of the wood pigeons and lay and listened till i could borrow a few quick beats of a wood pigeon's heart and when i did rise the morning sun on the shaken iris glistened and i saw that home this valley was wider than paradise i learned it all from my eve this warm dumb wisdom she is a finer instructress than years she has taught my heartstrings to weave through the web of all laughter and tears and now i see the valley fleshed all like me with feelings that change and quiver and all things seem to tally with something in me something of which she's the giver end of poem this recording is in the public domain dog tired by d h lawrence read for librivox dot org by eva davis if she would come to me here now the sunken swaths are glittering paths to the sun and the swallows cut clear into the low sun if she came to me here if she would come to me now before the last mown harebells are dead while that vetch clump yet burns red before all the bats have dropped from the bough into the cool of night if she came to me now the horses are untackled the chattering machine is still at last if she would come i would gather up the warm hay from the hill brow and lie in her lap till the green sky ceased to quiver and lost its tired sheen i should like to drop on the hay with my head on her knee and lie stone still while she breathed quiet above me we could stop till the stars came out to see i should like to lie still as if i was dead but feeling her hand go stealing over my face and my hair until this ache was shed end of poem this recording is in the public domain michael angelo by d h lawrence read for librivox dot org by larry wilson god shook thy roundness in his fingers cup he sunk his hands in firmness down thy sides and drew the circle of his grasp o man along thy limbs delighted thine his brides and so thou wert god shapen his finger curved thy mouth for thee and his strong shoulder placed thee upright art not proud to see in the curve of thine exquisite form the joy of the moulder he took a handful of light and rolled a ball compressed it till its beam grew wondrous dark then gave thee thy dark eyes o man that all he made had doorway to thee through that spark god lonely put down his mouth in a kiss of creation he kissed thee o man in a passion of love and left the vivid life of his love in thy mouth and thy nostrils keep then the kiss from the adulterous theft end of poem this recording is in the public domain violets 
by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Anne Fletcher. Sister, the knows while we was on the planks aside at grave, while coffin were lying yet on yellow clay, and white flowers top of it, trying to keep off and him a bit at wet, and parson making haste, and all the black huddling close together cause it rain, and did happen to notice a bit of a lass away back by a headstone, sobbing and sobbing again. How should I be looking round, and me standing on the plank beside the open ground where our Ted had soon be sank? <sighs> and him that young, snapped sudden out of all his wickedness, among pals worse nor any name as you could call. Let be that. There's some at bad as we like better nor all your good, and he was one. And cause I liked him best, I had better nor thee. I can abide to think where he is gone. I know thou liked him better nor me. But let me tell thee about this lass. When you'd gone, I stopped behind on padding dripping wet and watched what her had on. I should have seed her slive up when we'd gone. I should have seed her kneel and look in at sloppy wet grave and her little neck shone that white and her shook that much I'd like to begin screeting Miss Anne as well and undid her black jacket at bosom and took from out of it over a double handful of violets, all in a pack ravelled blue and white, warm, for a bit of smell come wafting to me. Her put her face right into them, and screeched out again. Then after a bit, her dropped em down that place, and I come away, because of the team in rain, End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Whether or Not by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Anne Fletcher. Dunna thee tell me it isn't, mother. Dunna thee. Dunna thee. Oh, aye. He'll be coming to tell thee his sen, wench, won he? The doesna mean to say to me, mother, is gone with that. My gal, out'll do for a man in the dark. Thou's got it flat. But her's old, mother. Her's twenty year old in her aim. Aye, and yaller as a crow flower. And yet in dark, her'd do for Tim. Thou never believes it, mother, does ta? It's somebody's lies. Ask him this end, wench. Widow's lodger. It's no surprise. Widow of forty-five, with a bitter swarthy skin, to a tyster lad of twenty-five, and him to have been two kin. A widow of forty-five, as a sludge like a horse all her life, till her's tough as wit leather, to slive between a lad and his wife. A widow of forty-five. A tough old ochel, with long witch teeth and her black oak eyes as I've mistrusted all along. And me, as has kept me and shut like a daisy bud, clean and new and nice, so as when he wed, he'd have summat good. And him as nice and fresh as any man in force. To a gone and given his white young flesh to a woman that coarse. You're stout to brave this snow, Miss Stainwright. Are you making Brinsley way? I'm off up line to Underwood. We address as is wanted today. Are you going to Underwood? Happen then you've heard. What's that as happen I've heard on, missus? Speak up, you needn't be afeard. Why, you're a young man and 
widow nailer her is he lodges wi they say he's got her wi child but there it's nothing to do wi me though if it's true they'll turn him out at police force without fail and if it's not true i'd back my life they'll listen to her tale well i'm believing no tale missus i'm seeing for miss hen and when i know for sure missus i'll talk then nay robin redbreast thou needna sit nodding thy head at me my breast as red as thine i reckon flayed red if thou could but see nay you blessed peewips you needna screech at me i'm screeching miss hen and are going to let everybody see thou art smock ravelled bunny larrapin neck and crop it's snow but i'd warrant thee bunny i'm further o'er at top now see thee there at railroad crossing warming his sen at the stool at fire under the tank as fills the engines if there isn't my dearly beloved liar my constable we is button breast as stout as the truth my sirs and his face as bold as a robin it's much he cares for this nice old shame and disgrace oh but he drops his flag when he sees me yes and his face goes white oh yes thou can stare at me with thy fierce blue eyes but thou doesna stare me out i guess whatever brings thee out so far in all this depth of snow i'm taking home a wedding dress if thou mun know why is there a wedding at underwood as that ned trudge up here it's widow nailer's wedding dress and her's wanting it i hear her does no want no wedding dress what 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 does mean doesn't you know what i mean tim yeah that must have been hard to ween that a good un at suckin in yet timmy but tell me isn't it true as her'll be wanting my wedding dress in a week or two there's no occasions to have me on lizzie what's done is done done i should think so done but might i ask when thou be gone it's thee as has done it as much as me lizzie i'll tell thee that me gotten a child to thy landlady has gotten the answer pat as thou allers has but let me tell thee hadn't a sent me home when i was almost bursting mad o' miss hen and walking in agony after thy kisses lizzie after thou's lying right up to me lizzie and melted into me melted into me lizzie till i was verily swelted and if my landlady seed me like it and if her cloaking tiger's eyes went through me just as the light went out is it any cause for surprise no cause for surprise at all my lad after licking and snuffing at me that could turn thy mouth on a woman like her did to find her good i did but afterwards i should like to have killed her afterwards <laughs> and after how long were it that like to have killed her say no more liz dunna thee i might lose miss hen i'll only say good-bye to thee timothy and gear thee back again i'll take thee word good-bye liz but i shanna marry her i shanna for nobody tis very nice on you sir the child mun take its look it mun and she mun take her look for i tell ye i shanna marry her what her's got her took that's spoken like a man timmy that's spoken like a man he up and fired off his pistol and then away he ran i damn well shanna marry her so chew at it no more or i'll chuck the flaming lot of you you needn't have swore that's his collar round the candlestick 
and that's the dark blue tie i bought him and these is the woman's kids he's so fond on and here comes the cat that caught him i don't know where his eyes was a great round-shouldered hag my sirs to think of him stooping to her he'd wonder he could throw hisself in that sink i expect you know who i am mrs naylor who oh, you are yes you're lizzie stain right and happen you might guess what i've come for happen i mightn't happen i might you knowed as i was courting tim murfin yes i knowed he were courting thee and yet you've been carrying on wi him ay and him wi me well now you've got to pay for it and if i am what's that to thee for he isn't going to marry her oh, is it a toss up twixt thee and me it's not toss up twixt thee and me then what art carly fogling for i'm not having your oats and slats which one i said you were i want you to know he's not marrying you thou wants him they send to bad though i'll see as he pays you and comes to the scratch that for doing a lot were it lad to think i should have to apple and caffle we a woman and pay her a price for letting me marry the lad as i thought to marry we cabs and rice but we'll go unbeknown to the registrar and give her what money there is for i won't be beholden to such as her for anything of his take off the duty stripes tim and come with me in here take off the policeman's helmet and loop me clear i wish i hadn't had done it tim i do and that i do for whenever i look the imp face i shall see her face too i wish thou could wash her off and thee for i used to think that thy face was the finest thing that ever met my eye hmm. twenty pound of thy own last and fifty pound i thine shall go to pay the woman and we my bit will buy all as we shall want for furniture when thou leaves this place and we'll be married at registrar now lift their face lift their face and look at me man up and look at me sorry i am for this business and sorry if i have driven thee to such a thing but it's a poor tale that i'm bound to say before i can take thee i've got a widow of forty-five to pay don't think but what i love thee i love thee well but deed and i wish as this tale of thine were never my tale to tell deed and i wish as i could have stood at the altar with thee and been proud of thee that i could have been first woman to thee as thou art first man to me but may mon make the best on it i'll rear thy child if her'll yield it to me and then with that twenty pound we gear i should think her wouldn't be so very much worse off than i were before now look up and answer me for i've had my say and there's no more sorrow to sup <sighs> that's a man that's a fine big man but never a babby had eyes as sulky and omin as thine hast out to say otherwise from what i've arranged with thee hey man what a stubborn jackass thou art kiss me then there no mind if i screet i were fond of thee sweetheart end of poem this recording is in the public domain. A Collier's Wife 
by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Anne Fletcher. Somebody's knocking at the door, mother. Come down and see. I think it's nother to beggar. Say I'm busy. It's not a beggar, mother. Hark, how hard he knocks. If he's out a mad ass kid, he'll give his socks. Shout and ask what he wants. I canna come down. He says, Is it Arthur Holliday's? Say yes, the clown. He says, Tell your mother as her master's got hurt in pit. What? Oh, my sirs, he never says that. That's never it. Come out at way and let me see. Hey, there's no peace. And stop this screeching child. You shut the face. Your master's had an accident and they're taking him in the ambulance to Nottingham. Hey, dear me, if he's not a man for mischance. Where's he at this time, lad? I don't know. They only told me it were bad. It would be so. Hey, what a man. And that cobbly road, they'll jolt him almost to death. I'm sure he's in for trouble nigh every time he takes breath. Out of my way, child. Dear me, where have I put his clean stockings and shirt? Goodness knows if they'll be able to take off his pit dirt. Oh, and what a moan he'll make. There never was such a man for a fuss if anything ailed him. At least I shan't have him to nurse. Oh, I do hope it's not very bad. Hey, what a shame it seems as some should have hardly a smite of trouble and others as reams. It's a shame as he should be knocked about like this, I'm sure it is. He's had twenty accidents if he's had one. Out bad, and it's his. Oh, there's one thing. We'll have peace for a bit. Thank heaven for a peaceful house. And there's compensation, seeing it's an accident. And club money. I needn't grouse. And a fork and a spoon he'll want, and what else? Oh, I shall never catch that train. What a trip it is if a man gets hurt. I should think he'll get right again. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Drained Cup by D. H. Lawrence, read for LibriVox.org by Anne Fletcher. The snow is withering off on the grass. Love, should I tell thee somewhat? The snow is withering off on the grass, and a thick mist sucks at the clots of snow, and the moon above in a wedding dress goes fogged and slow. Love, should I tell thee somewhat? There has been snowed up in this cottage with me. Nay, I'm telling thee summat. There has been snowed up in this cottage with me, while clocks has all run down and stopped, and the short days withering silently, unbeknown, have dropped. Yea, but I'm telling thee summat. How many days dost think has gone? Now I'm telling thee summat. How many days dost think has gone? How many days has the candlelight shone on us as thou got more white and wan? Seven days, or none. Am I not telling thee summat? Thou come to bid farewell to me. Thou art fright us summat to kiss me and shed a tear wi' me. Then off and away with a wedding ring. For a girl who was grander and better than me for marrying. That fright a summit. I durst na kiss thee, thou trembles so. That fright a summit. Thou aren't very flag to go. Happen the mist from the thawing snow daunts thee. It is na for love, I know. 
that thou art loath to go. Dear me, say summat. None that cling to the wall as thou goes, so bad as that. Thou'lt never get into thy wedding clothes at that rate. Eh, hey, there goes the hat. Ne'er mind. Goodbye, lad. Now I lose my joy, God knows. And worse nor that. The road goes under the apple tree. Luke, for I'm showing this summit. And if it weren't for the mist, they'd see the great black wood on all sides of thee, with the little pads going cunningly to ravel thee. So listen, I'm telling thee summit. When thou comes to the beach and avenue, I'm warning thee o' summit. Mind thou shall keep inwards a few steps to the right, for the gravel pits are steep and deep wi' water. And you are scarce of your wits. Remember, I warned you, Summit. And mind when crossing the plank and bridge. Again, I warn you, Summit. You slip not on the slippery ridge of the thawing snow, or it'll be a long put back to your grand marriage, I'm telling ye. Nay, art a scared of Summit. In kept the thick black curtains drawn. Am I not telling thee summit against the knocking of sevenfold dawn and red tipped candles from morn to morn have dipped and danced upon thy brawn till thou art worn? Oh, I have cost thee summit. Look in the mirror and see this end. What? I'm showing thee summit. Wasted and wan, I sees this end, and thy hand that holds the mirror shakes till thou drops the glass and thou shudders when thy luck breaks sure thou art afraid of summit frail thou art my saucy man listen i'm telling thee summit tottering and tired thou art my man thou came to say good-bye to me and thou's done it so well that now i can part with thee Master, I'm giving thee summit. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Schoolmaster by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org. One. A Snowy Day in School. All the slow school hours round the irregular hum of the class have pressed immeasurable spaces of hoarse silence muffling my mind as snow muffles the sounds that pass down the soiled street. We have patterned the lessons ceaselessly, but the faces of the boys in the brooding yellow light have shone for me like a crowded constellation of stars, like full-blown flowers dimly shaking at the night like floating froth on an ebbing shore in the moon out of each star dark strange beams that disquiet in the open depths of each flower dark restless drops twin bubbles shadow full of mystery and challenge in the foam's whispering riot how can i answer the challenge of so many eyes the thick snow is crumpled on the roof it plunges down awfully must I call back those hundred eyes? A voice wakes from the hum, faltering about a noun. My question. My God, I must break from this hoarse silence that rustles beyond the stars to me. There I have startled a hundred eyes, and I must look them and answer back. It is more than I can bear. The snow descends as if the dull sky shook in flakes of shadow down and through the gap between the ruddy schools sweeps one black rook the rough snowball in the playground stands huge and still with fair flakes settling down on it beyond the town is lost in the shadowed silence the skies distil and all things are possessed by silence and they can brood wrapped up in the sky's dim space of hoarse silence earnestly and oh, for me, this class is a bitter rude.
2. The Best of School The blinds are drawn because of the sun, and the boys and the room in a colorless gloom of underwater float. Bright ripples run across the walls as the blinds are blown to let the sunlight in. And I, as I sit on the beach of the class alone, watch the boys in their summer blouses as they write, their round heads busily bowed. And one after another rouses and lifts his face and looks at me, and my eyes meet his very quietly. Then he turns again to his work with glee. With glee he turns, with a little glad ecstasy of work he turns from me, an ecstasy surely sweet to be had, and very sweet while the sunlight waves in the fresh of the morning. It is to be a teacher of these young boys, my slaves only as swallows are slaves to the eaves they build upon, as mice are slaves to the man who threshes and sows the sheaves oh sweet it is to feel the lad's looks light on me then back in a swift bright flutter to work as birds who are stealing turn and flee touch after touch i feel on me as their eyes glance at me for the grain of rigour they taste delightedly and all the class as tendrils reached out yearningly slowly rotate till they touch the tree that they cleave unto that they leap along up to their lives so they to me so do they cleave and cling to me so i lead them up so do they twine me up caress and clothe with free fine foliage of lives this life of mine the lowest stem of this life of mine the old hard stem of my life that bears aloft towards rarer skies my top of life that buds on high amid the high wind's enterprise they all do clothe my ungrowing life with a rich, a thrilled young clasp of life. A clutch of attachment, like parenthood, mounts up to my heart, and I find it good. And I lift my head upon the troubled, tangled world, and though the pain of living my life were doubled, I still have this to comfort and sustain. I have such swarming sense of lives at the base of me, such sense of lives clustering upon me, reaching up as each after the other strives to follow my life aloft to the fine wild air of life and the storm of thought and though i scarcely see the boys or know that they are there distraught as i am with living my life in earnestness still progressively and alone though they cling forgotten the most part not companions scarcely known to me yet still because of the sense of their closeness clinging densely to me and slowly fingering up my stem and following all tinily the way that i have gone and now am leading they are dear to me they keep me assured and when my soul feels lonely all mistrustful of thrusting its shoots where only i alone am living then it keeps me comforted to feel the warmth that creeps up dimly from their striving it heartens my strife and when my heart is chill with loneliness then comforts it the creeping tenderness of all the strays of life that climb my life three afternoon in school the last lesson when will the bell ring and end this weariness how long have they tugged the leash and strained apart my pack of unruly hounds i cannot start them again on a quarry of knowledge they hate to hunt i can haul them and urge them no more no more can i endure to bear the brunt of the books that lie out on the desks a full three score of several insults of blotted page and scrawl of slovenly work that they have offered me i am sick and tired more than any thrall upon the woodstacks working weariedly and shall i take the last dear fuel and heap it on my soul till i rouse my will like a fire to consume their dross of indifference and burn the scroll of their insults in punishment i will not i will not waste myself to embers for them not all of them shall the fires of my life be hot for myself a heap of ashes of weariness till sleep shall have raked the embers clear 
i will keep some of my strength for myself for if i should sell it all for them i should hate them i will sit and wait for the bell end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of love poems and others by d h lawrence